because were you ever diagnosed with candida as part of your oh, healing journey? I think you were, right? For sure. Well, I've kind of, se- I self-diagnosed myself with candida. That was like the first thing I thought was going on. Which could be a slippery slope, self-diagnosing yourself. Oh, first for of sure. All. So like I, you know, there is a website, I think it might be called like candida, candidadiet.com. It's like the most generic, like hatred of anything carbs, like mentality on that website. So I went there, which was not a good choice because I went off the deep end diet wise. I believe for like the first five to seven days, they tell you not to eat any meat. So it's literally just like broth and vegetables. And then What's the rationale kind of, of the meat? Do you remember what the rationale of the meat? Who is? knows? Who knows? I have no idea. But I do remember it was like just vegetables and like maybe some broth, but nothing else besides that. Then you add in the meat and then you kind of layer things in. But like total fear of sugar and carbs began at that point, I feel like for me, because it's so the mentality in this the candida space is so anti-sugar, anti-carb in general. Well, it's very similar to the SIBO space, right? Like if you kill it, they will win and you will lose. End of story. Right. So I was definitely in that mindset. I did terribly on low carb, but kept pushing through thinking this was all die off or something, you know? Oh, I'm tired. It's just, it must be working. (laughs) You get into like this deranged mindset, I feel like. I know I was where it's like, I thought that because I felt bad it was working, but it definitely was not. And, but then I I went in the SIBO route and there could have been some candida there at some point, who knows. Um, But I went the SIBO route and when I treated with antibiotics, then I actually did have a horrible candida fungal issue Mm. after that, where I was actually getting like nail fungus popping up, like some other infections elsewhere. So I got, I had nail stuff going on. I had like horrendous brain fog that I think was heavily associated. I think there were other things at play with my brain fog too, but for me, antibiotics really triggered fungal issues and I took like Cipro so it wasn't even yeah. Rifaximin or the common ones it was like the most heavy duty antibiotic I heavy could hit. have possibly taken yeah. I took for SIBO and then my candida very much flared following that yeah um so that's generally my story. I would offer this first is that yeast is a normal inhabitant of the gut microbiome for humans. Mm -hmm. So don't, the mission is never to be totally candida free or yeast free. Right. That probably would be a bad thing for our immune system or our gut or our microbiome. Who knows? Um, But we also know a heck of a lot less about candida and yeast than we do bacteria. And that's saying something because we don't actually know that much about bacteria. There's like (laughs) 50% 50% of the gut microbiota is not named yet. Like we've observed, oh, there's like this other 50% of the bulk of the bacteria in your gut. We know you're there. We just haven't classified you or understood you or named you yet. So we're just going to kind of like nod our head at that. So if 50% of the bacteria in your gut are not even named yet, I mean, I feel like candida and yeast in the gut is actually like this big what is the line that they say? Like the last frontier almost yeah. like it's, it's so unexplored really. Again, there's such like a, I feel like middle road that we like that. I think we both like to find yeah. with working with people. And I think in, in a similar way as SIBO, CIFO or even candida in general gets this blanket, like, Oh, if it's there, you need to like starve it and kill it. Yeah. Like, it's a very similar mentality. And what you're saying, and I'm in total agreement with, is it's such a delicate balance. And I think even with candida, like you're saying, we don't know as much about no. what what this means that this level's high or this level's, yeah. um, or this particular fungal microbe compared to this fungal microbe. Is this one okay? Is this one not? Like we don't know all the nuances, even less so than the bacteria than the, we'd know about bacteria. So yeah. it, it's definitely mismanaged in the functional integrative space, which is 
a real bummer and then it's totally ignored in the conventional space so taking this middle road of a more nuanced approach of okay what does this mean if you have a fungal overgrowth what are the layers of this what systems could be down if you have candida or a fungal overgrowth like all this stuff needs to be explored um sometimes some more like clearing approaches are helpful sometimes not it just kind of depends on the the person and it just makes you wonder too because i like what you're saying about going down more of the herbal route which Mm -hmm. of course i'm partial to herbals versus antibiotics yeah um but i think that a lot of the herbal even some of the like common formula- formulations of the herbals that are used for SIBO. I'm thinking like FC Cytol, Dysbiocide, mm-hmm. even Candybactin, AR, BR, obviously mm-hmm. like have a candida aspect to them. Yeah. Um, so I think that they're probably more effective at taking out some of the yeast versus the antibiotics that don't. Yeah. Um, so I think again, like I, and maybe this is just personally because I had such a strong reaction to the antibiotics, but I do think that sometimes when people aren't super re- responsive to the antibiotics, it could be a, a fungal issue. Um, and like what you're saying, I've also been in the situation where I've had clients where I've said, maybe there's like a fungal issue going on and I have to be a little careful as well because I do remember one scenario where someone did sort of go down the rabbit hole and Mm. it was hard to reel that person back. Yeah. Um, And it probably wasn't a person that I should have been, like maybe we should have done a casual, like me sort of keeping it to myself and working on it behind the scenes because there were certainly some options that we could have done. But yeah, I I do think it's hard to know as a practitioner sometimes, like, should we go there or should we like kind of subtly do it? But I've definitely seen that before as well, where the anxiety uh, increases and you go down that rabbit hole and it's not really helping. So yeah, I think that restricting carbs, like actual food carbs, right? So if you are a person who's like, I just got diagnosed with candida yesterday, do I have to give up my Pop-Tarts? Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> yes. I mean, like, for the most part, yes. Yeah. Or, oh, man, that I can't have ice cream every single night? No. Yeah. So if you're having genuine, like, shit food, sugar, sugar, then that's my dividing line. And that's what I would say my recommendation is for candida diet stuff is, like, if it's, like, Skittles and Pop-Tarts, yes. I think it would be wise to cut that out. A, because maybe you're feeding the candida, but also, yuck, it's not healthy and we have to get your body healthy and that's end of story. So I think, you know, refraining from that stuff as much as is practical for the individual makes sense. But the moment you start saying like, I can't have that apple because it has sugar, or I I swear to God, I don't know if any of my colleagues from school are listening to to this podcast, but if they are, Simon, I'm going to call you out. I remember in clinic, we were at, our like clinicals, we were doing rotations and all of us interns were eating lunch in like the back room or whatever. And I had made this really great, it was like ground turkey, shredded up carrots, uh, I forget what else. And then it was like a lettuce wrap kind of deal. And it was so good. And I opened it, I had microwaved it, I brought it out to the table and Simon was like, oh man, that smells really good. And I'm a cool chick. So I was like, here, you want to try it? If you like it, I'll give you the recipe. And he said, oh no, I can't have that. Carbs have carrots. Or I'm sorry, uh, carrots have carbs. (laughs) Now, in his defense, he wasn't treating Candida. He was trying to get into bodybuilding. But I was like, (laughs) if I ever say the words, I can't eat a carrot because a carrot has carbs, (laughs) just shoot me now. Yeah. That's like the whole whole other level. My brain could not compute. I think there was smoke coming out of my ears the moment he said that. And I was just like okay oh more for me gosh. but i was i was gonna give him a bite of my lunch to see if he liked it and yes uh he could not eat carrots because carrots have carbs so simon if you're listening to this um i'm uh, that memory will be forever in my brain just like it's a natural kind of dirty jill <laughs> there are certain memories that will always be in my brain and i think that's the dividing line if you start restricting actual whole foods and whole grains and you know Um, Certainly the root vegetables, starchy vegetables, and fruit. I think that's where the candida diet has gone a bit too far for most people. 
And I do think like carrots are something that's under fire more than it should be. Cause I've, I've definitely heard people like I eat or, or even just saying like, well, I eat carbs, I eat carrots. And I'm like, no, that's not like, that's not necessarily not what I'm thinking of with carbs. Like, yeah, they're, they kind of are an in-betweener where they have some starch to them, but I wouldn't necessarily, yeah, I wouldn't necessarily say they're, they're like a carb rich food, no. like fruits and starchy Gosh. vegetable, like starchy vegetables, like potatoes. So that's definitely one I see a lot, which frustrates me because they're like, well, I eat some carbs, I eat some car- carrots or parsnip or, um, you know, these ones yeah. that aren't necessarily going to like meet your carb need because you ate a serving of carrots Mm -hmm. so there's just a a reference range that or a reference point that's so different between groups because like you go to the the candida groups and like anything over 50 grams of carbs is like whoa higher carb um and then you go to a traditional american diet and it's you know like 300 400 grams of carbs Mm -hmm. Um, the muffins at Starbucks, and it's like eight gazillion grams of carbs with sprinkled with sugar on top. That's what kills me. Like, why are we sprinkling muffins with actual granulated sugar? Um, but yeah, that's the kind of stuff to avoid. Beyond that, yes. just the absolute, the best thing you could do, diversity. Right, yeah. Because then you're going to get microbiome diversity, and you're going to get inhibition of your candida, and it's going to be rad. So the number one thing you could do, and actually, can we take another side tangent for a moment here? Yes, for sure. Have I ever told you about my Uncle Paul? No. Okay. Uncle Paul is super relevant in this conversation, both for SIBO and Candida, and I'm probably going to bring him up again. I adore my uncles. However, my Uncle Paul is not the healthiest eater, and the only vegetable that the man willingly eats is carrots. So, man, watch out, because you've got carbs, Uncle Paul. Yeah. But, you know, and he'll eat, like, pizza and shit food. But... He, the only vegetable he will willingly eat is carrots. So it's like a running gag in our family that we're always trying to like trick him into eating other stuff. So at Thanksgiving, every single year, I make what I call carrots and white carrots, it's parsnips. But I make this and I tell him, and he figured it out like the first year I did this and he just goes with it because he's cool. But I'm like, here, Uncle Paul, I made white carrots and carrots. It's your favorite. And he's like, okay. And he just eats it. And I'll never Aww. forget, I'm going to call, my uncle to me the first year I did this, I was like playing it cool. I'm like, yo, Uncle Paul, I'm peeling white carrots and carrots. Isn't that great? I'm going to roast them for you because we have to have carrots at at every meal for him. And he's like, oh, okay. And my Uncle Timmy (laughs) from like the other room from the living room, he goes, aren't those parsnips? Those look like parsnips. Those are parsnips, right? I'm like, shut up, shut up, shut up. (laughs) 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 Try to fool him. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. So anyway, so Uncle Paul figured it out real quick, thanks to Uncle Timmy. But yes, I I cook in that. But anyway, the point of this being, I always use him as an example. There's a point to my story, I swear. I use him as an example because my Uncle Paul could eat 30 servings of vegetables every week. But if he's only getting 30 servings of carrots, yeah. he's only ever going to feed the bacteria that like carrots, and he's only get the nutrients from carrots. End of story. So the poor bacteria in his gut that really like blueberries, or the poor bacteria in his gut that really like, I don't even know, like tomatoes, they're just going to be sad and starve for the rest of their lives, and they're going to die. But you'll have he will have an overabundance of the bacteria that really like carrots. So right. the whole game with diversity is if you eat a wide variety of plant foods, you're going to feed a little bit of food to everybody and then the whole clan can be happy. So now, you know, to kind of contrast it, you could take my Uncle Paul in theory and he's eating 30 servings of carrots per week. I don't think he does that, but he could. And he's getting 30 servings of vegetables, but it's one type of vegetable. Or you could have another Joe Schmo from the street who's eating, I don't know, like we're like picking people off on the street in Cincinnati or something. But you could talk to another person and they're eating 20 servings of vegetables per week, but they're having 20 different vegetables. Like that person's going to be way better off and they're going to be less likely to have candida and dysbiosis and inflammation because at least they're getting the diversity, even though the total amount of vegetables could theoretically be lower than the scenario I just painted. So that's actually my number one nutritional recommendation for anybody who's dealing with candida is try to get the diversity up. Because then right. you'll feed your microbes, they will inhibit candida, and then you'll all go frolicking off into the rainbows of the sunset and be happy together. Yeah. And sometimes it's easier said than done, but that should be the the goal moving forward. Um, right. I, I wholeheartedly agree. I think typically with me, 
when I work with clients, like the first steps are just making sure their nutrition's adequate. So overcoming the humps of like food fears and those, yeah, those issues, um, making sure their calories are where they need to be. And then kind of at that point, focusing on di- diversifying the diet and yeah. tweaking, fine tweaking the diet is typically what I, what I do with yeah. most clients. But I think you're totally right in a candida situation it makes a lot of sense that you're building up the ecology of the microbiome as a whole and mm-hmm. in feeding different microbes so that you're preventing any overgrowth of of things like candida and i think the same thing would go for a lot of uh, bacterial imbalances too like you yeah. want to make sure that you're feeding a, a variety of different microbes to prevent things from getting out of control 